this is Hot Rhythm TV. I'm your host, Dr. Tamarisa, and our wonderful guest today is Dr. Poole. Dr. Poole is a full professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, and it's an absolute honor to have her here. Dr. Poole, can you tell me more about your career path in EP? How did you get to where you are right now? Well, it's a fun tale to tell um, at this point in my career and looking back. I think that so much of what we do in life is not only what we're interested in and what um, we've been exposed to, but in a sense, what are our surroundings? And so for me, being in Seattle um, is where I was. It's where I grew up. It's where I went to medical school. It's where I did most of my training, not all, all of my internal medicine training, but most of it. And I was at a point um, in internal medicine where I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I'd gone into medicine, you know, thinking like a lot of people in Washington State that you would do primary care. We have a huge primary care um, <clears throat> initiative within our, our medical school. But I didn't really want to do that. And I was thinking about, well, what have I always enjoyed most? And I always enjoyed what I felt most challenged by. And I felt most challenged by intensive care unit patients and, and specifically cardiology intensive care unit patients. And they were the ones that challenged me to really have to think harder. So I, I always was somebody that went after the harder task in a sense. So um, I was fortunate enough to have um, been acquainted by that point in time with the then um, division chief of cardiology, Ward Kennedy. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know him. He's kind of the father of streptokinase. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so just, oh, wow. a, just a great mentor. And so we sat down and we talked about cardiology. And I had missed the deadline for applying for cardiology, so I was gonna have this gap year, so to speak. And he said, you know, why don't you go work with Leon Green at Harborview Medical Center, which is our sister hospital. And I said, I've heard his name, but I don't really know what he does. He says, well, well he started an electrophysiology program. Oh, wow. I said, well, what is electrophysiology? He said, you just go over there and talk to him. And so I did, and of course what he was doing was so interesting. And, and within cardiology, arrhythmias, again, were that great challenge. They're scary, they happen unpredictably, and you know, they were, as a resident, you probably remember, it was always a very stressful time. Mm -hmm. So we sat down and, and we talked about what he was doing, and um, he had come from John Hopkins, where he was actually an interventional cardiologist. He was very interested in doing clinical trial work and was involved already with the CAST trial. So mm. some of these really pivotal trials mm. at that time. Wow. And he uh, really was one of the pioneers for programmed electrical stimulation as a way to evaluate patients for their risk of sudden cardiac death. And of course, back in that era, um, Michelle Morosky was just working on the ICD, right. you know, taking it from the first human implant to FDA approval by 1985. So that was really quite new. And we were using a lot of antiarrhythmic drugs. And, we would take patients post-cardiac arrest to the lab and we would induce them into an arrhythmia and then we would give them procainamide and then we would induce them again. Wow. Of course, that turned out to be just the worst thing we could have possibly Fine. been doing for patients, but you know, at the time we didn't know. But um, you know, as a mentor and a scientist, um, I was so fortunate to be able to work with him and he just really um, you know, just uh, spiked that interest in trying to solve the problems of arrhythmias. And in, Seattle, we were unlike anywhere in the nation except perhaps in Florida where Bob Meyerberg was because of the uh, Medic One system. And so with the hospital, um, Harborview Medical Center, again, the other university hospital, was where all of the survivors of sudden cardiac death came into the hospital. So, you know, we had all of these patients who were surviving out of hospital cardiac and, you know, really um, learning and trying to understand what to do with it. So that was my first introduction, and also introduction into clinical trial work was seeing um, Leon Green be very involved in leading these, these very important trials. So that was, that was the start, and that's what got me interested in electrophysiology. Beautiful, I mean, Par, what a growth in the field from CAS trial to now. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing, you know, we don't even think of those you know, program stimulation to right. <laughs> like you know, who does that, right? No one does that. But, uh, I see that sparkle and the passion in your eyes when you talk about it. It's amazing. Now, uh, for women and men who are well, wanting to look into the EP as a career <clears throat> path, give us some of your pearls of wisdom. Well, I think the most important thing is um, I take it from my own experience is, is, is that if EP um, and arrhythmias are something that you know get you excited. 
you just can't let anybody stand in your way. You know, it, it, that's true for everything in life. Absolutely. You know, if that is what you want to want to do and what you're interested in, you have to go after it. Now, that's easier said than done sometimes because sometimes people don't live in an area um, where um, that's readily available, or if they live in other parts of the world, you know, maybe it's very difficult to do that. I think you know, in the United States, it's of course a lot easier. And so if you're in medicine, in um, internal medicine level, and you already are starting to demonstrate that interest, hopefully um, the cardiology fellows around you are encouraging you, and hopefully within that you can get exposed to um, arrhythmias and electrophysiology. But ultimately it's a combination of uh, really committing yourself to that path mm -hmm. and you know, going through all these years of training that we um, have to do and then talking to the people that are at your institution and then starting to get um, connected to other people. So the great thing nowadays, of course, is that we can get connected to people through Zoom and you can get involved. Uh, I've, met, I've met several internal medicine residents who have come to this meeting mm -hmm. and general cardiology residents. So I think you know, people knowing that there's a society yes. uh, for electrophysiology mm -hmm. that is filled with men and women and people from all over the world is um, a great opportunity that people in my era did not have. I kind of stumbled into it, you know, sort of because I just happened to live where I lived. So um, I think having that initial drive and passion and not letting, you know, anybody tell you that, oh, you should do something different if that's really what you want to do and seeking out those mentors if they don't exist in your own um, program or where you happen to yes. live. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And another big feather, you know, in your all your achievements, I can't wrap everything in this interview, but I would like to focus on your editor-in-chief for Heart Rhythm O2 Journal. Being a woman in the field, how did you get there? Tell me more about that journal and what's your journey like achieving that title? Well, the journal's wonderful. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll start with that. Yes. So we are um, well into our you know, second year of That's the journal. True. I'm really very, very excited about it. I feel like you know, we've been really able to get great papers in and now that we have PubMed citation true. status, um, you know, it's very exciting to see what we're doing. We've had um, really great participation from people in the electrophysiology field. Uh, great review articles and we've been doing what we call perspectives and contrast which is sort of that debate yes. Uh, yes. type yes. type of Those production. Are very nice so, so that's it's it's really fun so how did I um, you know get to that point um, well I, it's because I, I being in an, an academic environment and getting involved very early on in clinical trial work and working with great mentors who taught me about clinical trials and of course out of those trials comes the opportunity to write papers. Mm -hmm. And being able to work with the likes of the Duke's, Duke Statistical Group and the people at Mayo and the University of Washington, because we all did Scud Heft together and then went on and um, many of the same people went on to do Cabana. But in those, those early years in the 1990s and, and Leon Green and Gus Barty, you know, um, who really were fabulous mentors um, for details and meticulousness in writing. Mm. And you, you just, you couldn't be sloppy. And I really got trained on, you know, how to put together an abstract and how to present an abstract and how to write a book chapter and ultimately how to write a paper. Um, and that in the setting of, of, again, being fortunate enough to be, get involved in some of the really landmark clinical trials was the great breeding ground and training ground because before you can do something like being associate editor and editor-in-chief, mm -hmm. you have to really have written a boatload of papers yeah, and published and you know, been in that world. And then, um, you know, like all of us, getting the opportunity to start reviewing papers, mm -hmm. you learn so much when you have to review a Absolutely. paper. It forces you to think. You know, forces you to, to ask the question, not, well, what did they conclude? The question is, what were the methods? True. You know, that, True. sort That's of that whole, that whole trial process. So reviewing papers, ultimately being able to be on editorial boards and then an associate editor. I was associate editor for both Jack and Jackie P for a long time, and that was, you know, further training ground. So that by the time that the opportunity came up for HRO2, I really felt very well prepared to step into the editor-in-chief position. Um, and felt like I would, I would know how to do that, know how to bring associate editors into what you need to learn to be able to do that job well and be able to oversee the journal. And um, yes, I'm, very, I'm very proud of absolutely. the journal. Absolutely, you <laughs> have to be, and you, you know, that's a huge achievement. 
And uh, just to end the interview, um, give me a couple of lines on how to balance life. <laughs> Which is a very philosophical question, but yeah, the key one. It's a very philosophical question. How to balance life. Um, well, you know, I, th I think that to talk about it in some sort of a prescribed way is impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, for everybody has their own journey. I do think that it's very important for people to remember that there is life outside of work. And for a lot of people, that means one thing different from somebody else. I mean, I raised three children, so I did have that side of my life. Um, but, you know, everybody works that out in the way that works best for them. But I think the key is you do have a life outside of work, and that has to always be valued. And it has to be valued by the people that you work with, because as we go through life, that, that changes. My children are all growing up now, but I still have a life out of work. And we need to make sure that we're taking care of our health, and we need to make sure that we exercise. But it doesn't mean that we don't ever keep working hard, because that's just who we are. Yes. We are hard workers, we love what we do, we want to continue to contribute to our specialty. So I would say that um, it's important to recognize that work-life balance is important, and each person has to strive to find that for themselves, but not ignore it. Beautiful words of wisdom. And thank you so much for your time, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much.